Welcome, everyone. Happy Thirsty Thursday. Welcome to the first inaugural virtual tasting with the LCBO and tonight with Wines of Chili. I've got my co-host beside me, Eric Villan from the LCBO Food and Drink Magazine, and we are very excited to run through five excellent food and wine pairings from Chile with you. Feel free to have a bottle of Chilean wine open and taste along with us. And at the very end of our program, we're gonna go through some Q&A. So feel free to use the Q&A tab in your, in your box. Just a social responsibility message, please make sure you sip and savor responsibly and have fun tonight because I know Eric and I are looking forward into diving to, into some custom recipes that are all in the summer issue of Food and Drink and our five wines from Chile. Eric, what recipe are you most excited about to talk about tonight? Well, I'll think of the five. Uh, I developed three of them. Um, the one I'm most excited about is a vegetarian hot dog, but it uses a carrot uh, in place of the <laughs> hot dog. And it it took it took a, a number of tries to coax the, the flavor out of a carrot and give a, a hot dog experience to a vegetarian. But um, in the end, I was pretty proud of what we uh, what we did. Now, I know you had to really design a bunch of recipes for the magazine for, for this, uh, this edition. How many times did you test through the recipes and was it a, a, a fun process for you? Um, developing recipes is always fun. I've learned that um, if you put in more research before um, and you sort of test things in little bits instead of just testing the whole recipe, um, you can... Minim, sort of minimize how many times you have to run through it, but ultimately you got to really test it until it's perfect. Because you know, the magazine reaches you know tens of hundreds of thousands of Ontarians, so if it's not right, you're going to hear about it. So, um, but it, it's a really fun process. You must have a lot of foodie friends that you can share those uh, experimentations with to come up with something perfect. <laughs> I'm very popular in the neighborhood. We did an ice cream cake, which is in that issue, and I, I, I remember. You know, you text people, like, do you want some ice cream cake? And, you know, right up, three seconds later in all caps, of course. So, yeah, it's, <laughs> I'm definitely popular in the neighborhood. It's always nice to be popular in the neighborhood. And those recipes, they sound so delicious. I can't wait to hear about how a carrot can imitate a hot dog and all the amazing ways that you tried to figure that out. Um, and, and along the process and how you develop these, I'm very intrigued and looking forward to hearing more from you. So, I hope everyone is is happy and ready to taste along with us with all of our wines from Chile. But before we get into our food and wine pairings, which I know we're all excited about because the barbecue is for the summer, these wines are built for the barbecue. But we're gonna learn about Chile and get ourselves acquainted with what makes Chile a viticultural paradise. Now in front of you, we have some incredible photos. Now, what I love about Chile is that it's in South America, it's long and it's a long and skinny country located on the west side of South America. Now it's an isolated paradise for grape growing. It's bordered by the Pacific Ocean to the west, the wonderful Andes Mountains to the east, as well as Patagonia ice fields in the south and the Atacama Desert to the north. That's incredible. Like those are some natural landscapes that help to really make grape growing just magical in this region. Also, there are 2,900 volcanoes, 500 that are actively contributing to unique soils for the vines, and there are over 105,000 kilometers of desert, making it the world's largest desert. The snow and the meltwater from the Andes help feed rivers and into many valleys, perfect for grape growing. And this is really what makes Chile such a magical place for grapes. Um, Eric, have you ever been to Chile? I have not been to Chile, but um, I tasted through the wines this morning and uh, I was just blown away at the quality to price ratio. It's arguably the best in the world. They're all approachable and what they're very dependable from vintage to vintage. There's a consistency to Chilean wines that you, you don't get in other places um, due to the climate and due to the, I think, due to the winemaking. And um, it's, uh, it, I mean, the Calatera, one of the Sauvignon Blancs we'll be tasting, is only ten dollars, and I can't believe that's only ten dollars. It, it it tastes like a wine, at least twice the price. It's uh, it's pretty awesome. 
I mean, you hit the nail right on the head there. The value that Chile offers and the amazing taste profiles. I mean, there's something for everyone. And you're right. The consistency is really what you crave from a country, you know, um, cons consistency, sustainability, quality. These are all wonderful um, attributes for, for Chilean uh, wineries. As we head into um, a little bit more on the vineyards, because you know I gave you a macro sense of where Chile is in the world, but as we dive into the vineyards, we're looking at some really interesting vine um, ways that the vines grow into grapes. So we have some really cool things like high altitude because of the Andes Mountains contributing to complex and unique grapes. And many of you may or may not know, but when you actually plant grapes on higher altitude, the vines and the roots have to search for water. And water is what makes your grapes complex. And we're going to get into a little bit more of that as we talk about dry farming um, into some of the other wines that we have. We also have volcanic soils, which add complexity to the fruit as well, leveraging this amazing notion of taste profile from grape to glass. We have coastal vineyards. I love, every, you know, I always say that grapes are like humans. In the day, you want a lot of sunshine. You want to bask by the pool. You want to, like, get tanned. And then at night, you want some more cool to relax and sleep. And grapes are the same way. So we have this coastal breeze that comes in off of the ocean that helps cool the area. And also this magical sun that helps to give those, those grapes full fruition and uh, into maturation. We also have big variations in climate conditions for grape growing from the east to the west. Now we did, just remember, we do have uh, Chile as a very skinny country, but very different than say California. We've got river valleys, we've got cool breezes for vineyards, um, and we have the effective elevation as you get close to the Andes. So here are some really great things to note. Some other things to, uh, as we get, before we get into our full tasting, almost all of the wines at the LCBO are from wineries that are certified sustainable. So there's a feel good part about buying wines from this region, which I really enjoy. We're gonna get into a bit more detail. But all of the wineries in today's tastings are certified sustainable. And um, as, as Eric did say, these wines are overperforming for their price range. So in fact, 70% of the wineries from Chile in totality are certified sustainable. There is an organic and biodynamic focus. And because they're in the Southern hemisphere, there is an op there, they have opposite seasons to us here in Canada. So right now they're in winter as we're in summer. Oh, Eric, I'm really looking forward to trying some of these wines and I'm getting hungry because it's dinner time. Oh, how are <laughs> you? Uh, how are you feeling over there? Are you excited about our food pairings? I'm definitely and, and just to, to you know, exp expand a bit on the sustainability part. Um, if you look in most of these wineries on their websites, go into great detail of what they do. And there's some really interesting things like, um, for example, uh, Montes uh, makes compost from the leftover grape skins and seeds, which is called the pomace. And this reduces the need for fertilizers by 30%. Calatera has a 50 wild horses on their property and they eat dry vegetation around on the hillsides. And that really cuts down on forest fires and a lot of these sustainability initiatives go beyond just the environmental uh, impact, it includes safety for its workers and the general health of the community that it's in. It's, it's, it's very impressive. So that definitely, I think when you're, when you're buying a Chilean wine, you're, you're, you know, there's a very high chance that you're supporting all these great initiatives. I love that too. There's like a feel, there's always a feel good part about buying wine. You know, you want wine at a good price and you want to feel good about where that money's going and the people that are being taken care of and the land that's being reinvigorated for future generations. It's really important. And I think Chile's doing a fantastic, um, they're doing just a fantastic version of what really needs to be done in the world. So um, I'm excited. Should we cheers and start off with some sparkling, sparkling All wine? Right. Get everybody started. Sounds good. I hope, <laughs> yeah. I hope everyone has opened a bottle of Chilean wine to join us for this tasting, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing about what you're um, what you're sipping on tonight. So the first uh, recipe we have here is a, a super simple appetizer. It's uh, apricot and halloumi skewers, and all it is is fresh apricots, uh, halloumi cheese, you know, skewered, grilled, and brushed with a glaze of uh, honey, lemon juice, and sriracha. Dead easy to appetizer. Um, hmm. If you don't know what halloumi is, it's a brined, firm, sort of springy cheese that's traditionally made from sheep's and goat milk, although many of the mainstream brands you'll find at the supermarket use cows instead. 
Um, I like to think of it as sort of, it has that springy texture of mozzarella, but it has more of the briny flavor of feta cheese. Um, what makes halloumi unique is its high melting point, which means when you cook it, it doesn't actually melt, it, it still holds its shape. Um, so it gets a crispy exterior, sort of a gooey interior, mm. and um, it never really melts onto, so it, you can use it for appetizers like this. Um, since it's so firm in texture and salty, it's really nice to pair it with something, either like serve it in tomato salad, or in this case, we serve it with something soft and sweet like fruit. It needs that sweetness to balance the saltiness. And um, despite this dish's simplicity, there's a lot going on. It's salty, sweet, sour, smoky, and spicy. It's, it's a pretty terrific dish. And I think when it comes to pairing, sparkling wine is your best bet for sure. Um, bubbles and sparkling wine always refresh your palate after salty and rich foods. And the acidity in, in this one particularly um, helps you know, sort of cut through the richness of the cheese. So just, um, you know, for my lack of barbecue experience here, so you put everything on a stick and then you put it on the barbecue, basically. Correct. Yeah, like a skewer. So that's, that's I mean, a re really easy way for anybody that doesn't really know how to do barbecues to be able to just pull it together and you grill it on either side and that's what, a and you're drizzling it with something fun, aren't you? Is there a drizzle on there? Yeah. It's, a, yeah. it's a sort of a sweet and sour mix of all this honey, lemon juice yeah. and sriracha hot sauce, yeah. Yeah, that's so great. I mean, sparkling wine is such a great answer to so many things because you were talking about, you know, this very complex dish when it comes to flavors. We've got spicy, sweet, we've got savory, we've got umami too, we've got the cheese. We have all these wonderful compounds that are going on in our palate. And sparkling is beautiful because that little bit of effervescence, that, you know, that really nice dryness will help cleanse your palate and bring bring to life all those flavors. It'll really complement your dish. I mean, this 100% uh, Pinot Noir Connoisseur Sparkling Rosé that's $14.95 in the LCBO. It's from Bio Bio Valley, which is the most southern region, um, one of the most southern regions in the world, actually, where you can grow where you can grow grapes. And so, obviously, the more south you go, we're getting cooler because we're down in, near Patagonia. So we're getting Pinot Noir here, which is a cool climate grape. We have notes of raspberry, gooseberry cherry those creamy hints too which is really great that creamy and creamy goes with the cheese and those hints of um fruit come out that will nicely complement the fruit in this dish and uh this is nice to serve almost as you're as you're en route to the barbecue you could open this barbecue the dish and then finish finish the bottle off as the as the dish comes to the table but this is a wonderful wine it's actually grown in red clay soils with hand-picked grapes and i mean if you like prosecco this is a fabulous wine to uh to also try because it's nice and pink in color, which makes it beautiful. People love pink, uh, you know, pink rosé and sparkling. And uh, this winery is founded in 1993. It's a fantastic winery. In fact, on the back of the bottle, they even talk about how they're carbon neutral. So once again, we've got very a sustainable message going on here. And um, I was lucky enough to actually ride a bike through this vineyard when I was in in Chile. And so it's uh it has a bit of a memory to me. So well done. I mean, I can't wait. I, I, can't wait to try this dish out on the barbecue. What did you think of the wine? Oh, it's terrific. Yeah, it, it, I would take this over most Proseccos in the same price point. Um, sort of better acidity, um, really nice wine. I would even pair this with something because of those red berry flavors, something like duck. Yeah, I think it'd even mm. go nicely with. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a terrific wine for the price, for sure. A terrific wine by any standards, let alone for fourteen ninety five, yes, it's it's gorgeous. I one hundred percent agree. It was a a fabulous a fabulous pick. So, so on to the I'll next to recipe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a uh, called all the vegetables platter with three dips. Um, it's more definitely more elaborate than the uh, the previous appetizer. So it's a bunch of grilled summer vegetables. And you serve with three dip, different dips, uh, smoky chorizo butter, sort of a sharp Dijon vinaigrette, and sort of a funky, you know, sort of traditional blue cheese dip. Um, it's sort of a fun twist on a classic crudité platter, except all the vegetables are cooked rather than raw. And sort of cooking the vegetables offers more flavors and textures and, you know, it's also easier to digest. I, I think definitely more popular um, than just a bunch of raw vegetables. A lot of people doing both, some raw, some cooked, just to mix things up. Mm. Um, it's a showy dish, as you can see, uh, though you can make things easier um, by just grilling three or four vegetables and serving one of the dips. 
you don't have to feel obliged to do the whole thing. Um, that's it with recipes. You ne never, you know, if it sort of feels like something intimidating, you know, cut a few things out and then make it less intimidating that you, so you want to do it. Um, there are no rules. Um, and there's also certain flexibility. Sure, you can use whatever is in season, whatever you, you know, picked up at the supermarket market. Sometimes you can just use whatever happens to be in your fridge. You know, some green onions or, you know, sweet potato that's in the back pantry. You can do, you don't, you don't have to buy everything market fresh. It's, it, it, it can be equally delicious just using stuff that's in your fridge. And I think for pairing this wine, it's a little trickier because there's a lot going on. But I think a medium bottom white, medium bodied white, um, sort of it's just just crisp enough to match the lighter vegetables, but you know has a little more weight to match the bigger things like you know uh, grilled mushrooms. And uh, I think we have a, a, a terrific match here. Which I now I've more. seen it done both both ways on the grill, where you line it with olive oil and then you put it on the grill, or do you are you just putting the veggies on the grill like without anything sort of naked, if you will? Uh, in some cases, you could you do that because you want the grill marks. But in some cases, mm -hmm. um, when they're smaller, like radishes, fiddling with radishes, it's easier just to yeah. put them in a basket. Um, mm -hmm. So it gets a bit of that smoky char, but you know you're not fiddling with them or they're not falling through the grates. Um, uh, it's just sort of a mix. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a it's a, I feel like it's a talent kind of putting veg on the grill and figuring out like how to how to do it perfectly, but that. So that when you bite into a grilled vegetable, especially as a not as a main course, as an appetizer, that mm -hmm. charriness is so interesting. Um, before you know you've had steak or anything like that, but that purely as an appetizing state, it's that barbecue and that char meshed with Sauvignon Blanc is like, whoo! That is a complimentary pairing on your palate to just please every part of your mind, body, and soul. <clears throat> And this is a wonderful wine. This is from Erasmus. So it's medium bodied. It's got fresh, grassy aromas, which is what makes it so great with all of the uh, different types of crudite you could put on this on this amazing platter. It's got citrus, green apple. Um, I love that there, to me, when I smell it, I immediately think Sauvignon Blanc. It is it is undeniably a Sauvignon Blanc to me in on the nose. Um, so I immediately know I'm going to love it. They're hand-picked grapes. There's a little bit of lees contact too to add some weight and texture to this wine, which is also what you need when you have sort of grilled veg in front of you, is some nice texture to battle out those uh, that, that, some of those flavors from the grill for added weight. I mean, and this winery has been around a while. This is, I think this year, Erasmus turns 150 years old. So this is a pretty, you know, established winery. They know what they're doing with their vines. They have an integrity behind the wines that they produce. And this is undeniably a, a Sauvignon Blanc that will, you know, for you Sauvignon Blanc lovers, this is, this is definitely should be on your list. I think we have two Sauvignon Blancs back to back. Which is very exciting. I think so that, uh, yeah. So next recipe is also paired with a Sauvignon Blanc, a totally different style. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. These are the famous carrot dogs that were so beautifully styled. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah the, the, the food stylists and the photographers that Food and Drink uses are ex extremely talented. I'm always blown away at how they bring our, our recipes to, to, to vivid life and make them so appetizing, make, make everyone want to do them. Um, so this recipe is the aforementioned carrot dogs. And mm -hmm. now carrots have been used as a vegan substitute for hot dogs for a few years in, in sort of plant-based circles. Um, but a lot of the time they're just served with kind of ballpark condiments like ketchup and mustard. And when I've tried that, it just didn't really work for me because I don't think ketchup and mustard go well with carrots. So when I did this recipe, I first, you pre-cooked the carrots in sort of a, a bath of carrot juice and miso and maple and smoked paprika. So it, it get, you know, layers of flavor and umami um, that you would get from a hot dog. And then, you know, you finish it on the grill. So it gets a bit of crispiness and that smokiness, but instead of serving it with ketchup and mustard, um, you know, I came up with condiments that are far more carrot friendly. Um, there's sort of a curried, uh, garlicky curried yogurt, which brings a little tang. Um, it's raw onion. Uh, there's pistachios, which kind of, give you a bit of crunch because you don't get any snap from the carrot like you mm. would for a hot dog. Mm. And then sort of rounding it all out is, uh, is cilantro, which is, which is really amazing with carrots. Mm. Um, there's, wow. this is, this is a labor intensive recipe, but it's one of those recipes mm. where you can pre-cook the carrots. They last like five days in the fridge, 
make all the condiments, have everything ready. So when it comes time to dinner, these dogs, you know, it only takes, you know, five minutes to grill the dogs and, and, and dinner's ready in, in a matter of minutes. So, you know, at food and drink, we try to make, you know, a mixture of easy and more elaborate recipes, but you know, when, when we try to avoid all, a bunch of aluminum cooking, so you aren't frazzled by the time you eat dinner. Um, definitely these dogs also go well with a, a, a Sauvignon Blanc because you need that acidity to, to temper the sweetness of the carrots and yeah. those herbal notes of a Sauvignon Blanc work extremely well with the cilantro. Well, and the savoriness of the carrot, like the miso in there and the maple syrup, you have this sort of like very interesting, like almost umami flavor that comes from the carrot, I would assume that, uh, you know, it's, it's, you need that cleansing. You need something nice and cleansing right after it. And is there a particular like bun? You, like, is it just a regular hot dog bun you'd use for this? Or you do know you what? A brioche um, bun or what do you use? Classic. Now there's an American company called Martin's that does these potato rolls and they become like the diverger. They're a lot easier to find now and they're sweet and they toast up really nicely. Um, cause it's, and it's very soft cause you don't want a big firm hot dog bun cause it'll overwhelm a carrot. It's, it's softer whereas it can handle a sausage or a hot dog. So I, I like Martin's potato rolls for this for sure. And it really mm. pays just to 30 seconds on the grill to toast them. And that adds that an, yet another layer, that textural, Kind of crispness uh, to something you know to already a, a quite a, a wonderful dish. Yeah, That's the one thing I'll do. Times? I'll test it without t toasting yeah. the bun. Testing with the toasting the bun, and it was so yeah. much. That one thirty second step made it so much better. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say the, the how many there. times did you have to roll through this this recipe to get this one right? This this one was the most challenging a lot for sure. But mm -hmm. I, I like those mm -hmm. recipes. I, I know I don't. Yeah. You know, some, sometimes you'll, with enough research, you'll nail a recipe in the first try, but it's almost more satisfying to like, you taste the first carrot dog and like, no, nah, this is not working. And then you, which, what went wrong? And, and the final thing was, okay, toast the bun. That was great. Mm. I mean, this, Although it's funny, we posted this on Instagram and there were some people that were not impressed with putting a carrot, a carrot in a hot dog bun. You can't please everyone. <laughs> I mean, I it's a very unique dish. And I think, you know, as the world moves to understanding more about plant-based diets and plant, plant-based foods in general, I mean, this to mm. me was the most, wow, I've never even heard or saw this. So to me, this was the most intriguing one when we were talking originally. And I mean, to pair this wine, I feel like, uh, this is, this is one of the best performing wines under $10 for Sauvignon Blanc that I have ever had. Like this is, I can't believe this, this wine is nine nine ninety five. This is so overperforming. I would, say this is the best value of the LCBO, like a white wine value, mm. for sure. Like it tastes as good yeah. as a Kiwi Sauvignon Blanc, all the Kiwi Sauvignon Blancs there are twice the price, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think they, um, they've changed up their label a little bit so you can see kind of they've got a new, I think the old labels have horses on them and these ones have uh, trees, which is, this is where you were talking about earlier about the, the horses in the vineyard, was, weren't you? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That was called it's, terrible, uh, yeah. yeah. That was Calterra, yeah. I mean, wonderful. What a wonderful wine for the summer to pick up a couple bottles for the cottage and try out this recipe. Like, this would be something I would love to try out. I, it would probably prove how bad I am on, on the barbecue, but I <laughs> maybe I would do all the prep and somebody else would manage the, the barbecue. But this is, a, this is quite an exciting recipe. Thank you for sharing that one. Okay, on to the Montez. We're into the red wine district of the barbecue. We are. I feel Next like recipe. You know, so, it's funny because I feel like when people think about barbecue, they think about red wine. And so I feel like we're in we're into barbecue right now of like the big meat kind of sections because we kind of explored a little bit of some interesting white wine and rosé pairings. So So the next recipe is um, a reverse seared uh, strip loin steaks with a charred scallion salsa. So reverse mm -hmm. searing is a become a very popular technique for cooking beef. So everything from steaks like this or or whole roasts um, the meat is first cooked in a very low oven, 250 degrees Fahrenheit, um, very slowly until it reaches the, de the desired doneness. We use a instant re thermometer. And then when you're ready to cook it, it's just slapped on a really hot pan or really hot grill to kind of get a charred crust. And it's sort of a, the concept is similar in spirit to sous vide. It's sort of very low, low cooking mm. and then a hot sear. 
And so it's an easy foolproof method that like literally everyone should know because it takes all the guesswork out of cooking steaks. Um, mm. And it, you spend less time standing over a hot grill um, and the steaks are very evenly cooked. It's sort of when you do a medium rare by reverse here, it's red to red from the end. There's no like gray tough end. It's, it's beautifully even and it still has that beautiful kind of charred exterior. And I mean, it's worth doing it on its own, but here it's served with a very punchy green sauce. Um, you know, it's, it's chimichurri-esque salsa verde. I mean, there's a whole family of green sauces, but this one is made different with mm. uh, grilled scallions, which adds more kind of a, a smoky flavor to it. And there's parsley and capers and garlic. So it, it really goes well with beef. Um, and ultimately this recipe is, is easy enough to make on a weekday. And the salsa, to be honest, can be made days ahead. It's one of those things, it, it may lose some of its green color, but it actually tastes better. The flavors sort of soften, mm. the onion softens, and it, they all melt together. It's, it's a great dish. And with steaks, you can't go wrong with the chili and cab for sure. Oh, I think Cabernet Sauvignon is the world's most popular and beloved grape. And I feel like if you love Cabernet Sauvignon, you have to go to Chile, open your liquid passport, enjoy the cab soaps from down there. It's, I mean, it's Cachalgo Valley where um, a lot of the wines that we're tasting from tonight, it's like you have, like I was talking about this incredibly, this viticultural landscape that is meant for wine. And cab just grows so naturally there when elongated season it has this wine too is like I, this, this wine from Aurelio Montes, who to me is a bit of a wine hero. He's, He's done wines for so long and and so great consistently. He's an amazing winemaker. And so they're just they constantly perform like way beyond their their price range. And this wine is is kept for well, only 50% of the wine is kept for 12 months in first, second, and third use oak. So there's a variance of oak treatment in here which really balances out the tannins. It makes it soft and supple, supple. It allows it to, you know, blend really nicely with the tannin in this dish, but also go with the green and a bit of that char. It's sort of this like really easygoing black dress of the wine wardrobe, you know, where it can fit into with a lot of really great things. And the Montes family, they're pioneers of dry farming. And I was talking about this a little earlier, but uh, they rely fully on rainwater. So there's no irrigation. Um, there's no, you know, water that kind of goes through the vineyards that, you know, the people put there. They wait for Mother Nature to bring rain to the vineyard. And this whole concept of theirs actually saves enough water to for 3,200 family families annually to to have fresh water to their to their to their house. Like this is incredible, you know. When you actually think about how you leverage Mother Nature's best quality, you make you work with your land and your vines and your grapes, and you help leverage them into the best possible wine that they can be. I mean, when I uh, when I was there, I remember being in the in the in the cellar and they play Gregorian chant music around around their barrels. So, I mean, it's kind of like a bit crazy, but at the same time you're going, you know what? It, if I were sitting in a barrel, I would like to listen to some music too. So, I mean, of <laughs> course. <laughs> and the the Montes family is hailed as the fourth best vineyard in the world. So, I mean, there's this wine is one of the most, Chile's most renowned producers. It's the world's most famous grape. I mean, this wine is near perfection. It's concentrated, it's complex, bucks. there's <laughs> generous fruit, it's fresh. I mean, grilled meats, this is this is the wine you pull out. You can decant it for, you know, they always say an, an hour in your decanter is equal to a year in uh, the cellar as a bit of a cheat sheet. So that's always something to, to throw out. I love being, I love throwing wine theater, you know, decant the wines, all the wines, especially if you're gonna drink them right away or within the next three or four hours, decanting is never a bad thing for your big bold reds. Oh yeah, that's delicious. It's so dynamite yeah. for twenty bucks. It's unreal. Yeah, yeah, and consistent. Yeah, like absolutely. it's consistently outstanding. Yeah. Mhm. Mm it's supple so too. I like recipe. that it's not aggressive. Oh, sorry. You know? No, oh, it's okay. Yeah. I was gonna say it's, it's nice that it's not an it's aggressive cab. It's, it's, like, it's smooth with a V. Smooth yeah, it's really good. Yeah. So on to the next yeah. recipe, um, which are these Moorish lamb chops with charred lemons. This is a super easy. Weekday recipe, um, although you could also serve it if you're having as an appetizer at a backyard barbecue because the bones have sort of a natural handle. Um, it's Spanish preparation, but it was influenced by the Moors who occupied uh, parts of the Iberian Peninsula for centuries. Um, so there's a lot of spices, so those spices from the Middle East, um, cumin and paprika and turmeric and oregano and um, they only, you can marinate them for an hour, that's it, if you really want it, you know, it, they're a little better if you go longer, but 
they're, they're perfectly delicious if it's just an hour. And they're you know, quickly grilled. The lamb chops are great because they're, they're relatively thin. They don't take more than usually three or four minutes per side. And they're served simply with a grilled lemons. And when you grill lemons, um, it makes them a lot more wine friendly because it softens mm. the acidity because lemons acidity is so bracing. But with, you know, with red wine, you don't want that lemony acidity. And, but it also adds some sort of nice caramel notes um, when, you, when you grill the lemons. And it's great with, with, with lamb. Um, and lamb, particularly in this sort of bold spicing, um, it's an excuse to really pull out a very you know, a big wine, um, you know, something even more than a Cabernet. And uh, I think we've got a great one here to go with it. I mean, this, this wine is definitely uh, like a top contender for like world's best wine. I'll tell you that because the, the Novus is a blend of uh, Carmenere and Cabernet Sauvignon and it's organic. It's vegan. It's sustainable. I mean, this winery and it's $16, which also, once again, you're just like, Oh my goodness, yeah. I can't believe that it. it's this, it's got dark berries, um, you know, green pepper. There's extra, it's full bodied. There's blackberries, spice, and I mean, it has Carmenere in it. For those of you who don't know who Carmenere is, I mean, we, we need to know Madame Carmenere. I mean, she's originally French, but um, from the Bordeaux region, she made her way over to South America during the Phylloxera. She was saved in South America, actually, and the original rootstock is saved down in Chile, and Carmenere is the grape of Chile. And so for me, it's like if you, if there was one, one thing you learned out of this entire seminar today other than the amazing halloumi skewer, skewers and the uh, the carrot hot dogs. It's Carmenere. It's the grape of Chile, and it's something you have to try. It's so lovable. And for me, this wine this spends 12 months in 60% oak, French oak, 10% untoasted, very large oak barrels, and 30% in stainless steel, giving it freshness. So you have a very, like, the winemaker put a lot of time and effort into figuring out the final taste of this wine. This is not a wine. It's just been aged in barrel, you know, hand-picked it's from organic vineyards it's hand harvested i mean it always blows my mind when i think about people who you know really want cheap wine and and you know i spent a whole month making wine and eric i know you believe in this philosophy too but like cheap wine is not a thing and you need to pay for every single process that happens along the way to make quality wine and when you can find a wine that is hand harvested from organic vineyards that's vegan that tastes this way for 16 dollars, it's just it's a bit mind-blowing yeah, this is this is. <laughs> I cannot. I wanted this complexity uh, for sixteen dollars is pretty amazing, and with all the other, the background of how it's made, it's 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 extremely impressive. It's true that the taste too for me, like it, it, it has a bit of a, a unique profile, which lamb to me also does. Lamb has a very unique profile when it's when it's you know on your plate, and so to pair with it, a grape that is a little bit unique as well is also like a fabulous. Mm -hmm. Um, way to complement your dishes because you know it has a little bit of that greenness but there's also blackberry spice and herbs and so it's quite an, a sort of a palate expander if you will um, with with your with your lamb with that little bit of char from that lamb off the grill um, just, what a wonderful pairing I'm sure that this would be fantastic with uh, the recipe that you put together for sure yeah it'll be dynamite and this mm -hmm. thing about some of these bigger red wines they, they, they they don't go with a ton of food, but that's why it's an excuse when you're when you're grilling something like lamb. It's an excuse to open a, a very big red, and um, this this wine would dominate a lot of any any lighter foods that could be too big for chicken. But boy, boy, would be great with this. And but it's still even despite its you know complexity, it's still got the freshness and it still has the acidity that pretty much all the wines we've tasted today have. It's 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 an impressive yeah. lineup. Yeah, that freshness once again is coming through, right? And I love that it's not, they're not obnoxious, aggressive wines. They're wines with, um, you know, they have, they have a skeleton, they have a backbone, they have freshness, they have the beauty that pair, makes them so beautifully paired with, with foods from all different types and walks of life. In fact, we have a very interesting question for you, Eric. Somebody asked, are the carrots in the carrot hot dog still crunchy? Uh, they have a little bite. Um, but you want to cook them to the point where they won't fall apart in the grill, but you don't want to be biting too hard into it. Otherwise condiments and, and bun will go, be flying everywhere. It's sort of, I experimented with that a bit. And if it was too al dente, it just, it was a mess to eat and it wasn't, it was less enjoyable. Um, 
you want it to cook to almost tenderness. Um, so to answer that question, no, the, the carrots are not crunchy. They're, they're softer. But that's why I added the toasted bun and the pistachios to add a bit of crunchy texture what that was missing from the carrot. Because the hot dogs, you get that, like with a meat hot dog, you get that snap that everyone loves, that, of, that which comes yeah. from the skin. Um, so you, you can't get that from a carrot. Um, so that's why I added the, the other textural elements. And Eric, do you know what type of food they'd serve with these wines in Chile? Do you know the Chilean sort of the Ch Chilean foods that would uh, go with these wines? Um, I don't necessarily, but I can give sort of. Um, I, I'm not that well versed on on Chilean cuisine, but I could sort of give general pairings for each one of these wines that would be sort of a little more applicable to North America. Um, the connoisseur. Uh, Sparkling wine, anything fried, anything salty, it's just so good. Again, it refreshes the palate. So even like one of my favorite pairings is sparkling wine and potato chips. It's like as a, as a sort of the, yeah, it's so good. And, and it really can handle salty foods and, and for any kind of fried foods like fried seafood. Um, mm. the, the air surich, which was our second one, um, it's, it's a little more vegetal, a little more herbal. I would go with green salads or asparagus um mm. zucchini you know things with peas like i think the flavors you get in that would complement definitely vegetable green vegetable dishes for sure um and classic goat cheese is a classic with sofia bonk so any any um any of those dishes calatera i definitely would pair with it with a south american dish um with ceviche for sure it's got those tropical mm. flavors it's got the acidity because when you're serving something super acidic like like ceviche the wine needs to match it and it's got that really zesty acidity um it would definitely be terrific with ceviche montes the cab on a more everyday thing off oh, just getting some takeout burgers some cheeseburgers it, it would just be it'd be perfect um i love that uh or even like it's and it's i think it's i think it's light enough on its feet to to pair with like a tarasco chicken or even just a rotisserie chicken from your supermarket i, I think it wouldn't mm -hmm. overwhelm it um the, the, the Carmenere and Cab uh, is almost unquestionably a red meat wine. Um, it, uh, or, or maybe like a, some sharp cheeses like um, Pecorino or like Tuscan Pecorino or Regi Reggiano, Parmigiano. It, it needs something big. Um, otherwise, it, it, would, it, would, it would overwhelm anything else. But that's sort of a general list of pairings. So I don't really know Chilean cuisine that well, but um, hopefully they'll find something you like. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of barbecue going on down there. You know, like there was a lot of barbecue. Like that's, yeah, that's they what like I grilled meat like in South America. Familia. It's very familiar down there where there's a big barbecue, there's sausages, there's meats, there's wine flowing. It's, you know, you're not thinking too hard about all these pairings. You're really just enjoying your company. You're, you know, enjoying the sunshine and the view and, and you're drinking great wine. But I think you nailed it on all of those sort of modern uh, pairings and extensive other pairings that people can, can pull together. I mean, you're always really looking for contrasting or complementing pairings. And you want to always pair the weight of the wine with the weight of the food. Right. I always feel like that's like a really easy rule. The, if the, the wine mm -hmm. is sort of light and fresh, pair something light and fresh with it. If it's deep, dark and delicious, you know, don't you know, don't hesitate about um, pairing something on the grill. And whether whether even that's um, something like pork or chicken, like you said, the minute you grill something and you get those that sort of black and charness on the meat, you can immediately pair something a little bit darker um, or deeper in the wine pairing category and and have some fun. I mean. Physiologically, we're all different. So pairings can obviously there's rules and there's like, you know, science behind pairings. But at the end of the day, it's it's all about you and your palate and your friends and your family and what everybody likes, isn't it? Exactly. You don't if you want to drink the Carbonier with fish and chips, just do it. If you enjoy it, but it's not <laughs> yeah. there, there are really no rules. Um 100%. So a couple of questions for you, Angela. Um yeah. why don't I see Carbonier in any other regions around the world? I mean, that's a really great question. I mean, Fluoroxera really killed the grape over in France. And there are small sort of pilings of it in, in France, but we don't see much of it or basically any of it here. But uh, luckily enough, the original rootstock is in South America where Fluoroxera never went. And so um, 
Chile's kind of really taken that in. And there are, there are small pockets of producers around the world sort of taking Carmen Air and trying it out in their vineyards. Um, but really, like, it is the home of, Ch Chile is the home of Carmen Air. So, you know, that's really why it's the superstar grape to me. You know, have every single region in the world has, you know, a family of grapes they do really well, but there's always a superstar that pops out. And Chile's superstar grape is Carmen Air. It has a wonderful... Um, taste profile to it. It's a little bit wild, a little bit rustic, very approachable. It's got some, you know, to me, it's kind of like a, a good personality when I, when you're down there and it's like, you know, somebody that's funny and fresh, but approachable and easygoing. And to me, that's what Carmen Air is all about in, in Chile. So you'll, you, you do see pockets of it popping up in the world, but really it's home is, is in Chile, mainly because of the rootstock, the lack of phylloxera in that region, and um, the, the, the wonderfulness of how it grows down in that little, that little skinny pencil of a country. So, um, final question for for you: uh, Which Chilean wine region makes the best sparkling, and why? Well, sparkling wine is really made in the more cooler climate region. So, I will say that throughout throughout Chile, you do have some areas that do produce sparkling wine. But Bio Bio is very special, actually, for connoisseur because it is the coolest, and so. Much like Champagne is the coolest region in France, and they're very well known for obviously sparkling wine. Um, the same can go for Chile. So Bio Bio Valley down in, in the south of, of Chile is very important because it's cool. It's got the coolness of the Patagonia um, coming up through it. So in order to make really great sparkling wine, you do need to be in a cooler, the coolest climate region of that particular region. Great, well, I think that's I think, it for questions. I know. I think that's uh, that's our virtual tasting tonight, Eric. What are you what are you what are you gonna be making for dinner tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Leftovers. <laughs> Leftovers. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing your amazing barbecue recipes with us. I can't wait to try some of these out on, on the grill. And thank you to everybody for tuning in to this wonderful night with Wines of Chile and the LCBO. Just a quick reminder to head to the Chilean wine section of the LCBO or lcbo.com and pick up some of your favorites over the next little while. They also, uh, what I love about the LCBO too is you can make an order and go pick it up. So it's actually really easy. You don't have to wait for somebody to deliver it to you. You can pick it up at an LCBO near you, which is really fabulous. And also before we conclude this virtual tasting, I wanna say that Chilean wine truly delivers sustainable quality, value at every price point i think eric you can agree that this tasting was you know, yeah. fantastic this was so so wonderful so i hope everybody tunes in next week for the lcbo virtual tasting on craft beer thank you and cheers have a wonderful night cheers thanks for coming cheers